This video is a recording of the NDS Association webinar held on March 11, 2021 about intelligent speed assistance reducing data consumption with NDS Live. Good, so hello and welcome uh, to the NDS Association webinar today. We will talk about how to reduce data consumption with NDS Live and we're going to illustrate that on a very hot topic, intelligent speed assistance today. Before we look at the agenda of what we're covering, allow me to promote the video recordings of our previous webinars about the advantages of NDS Live for intelligent speed assistance and what is NDS Live. We did these in February and the slides and full recordings are online. To see it, go to the news section on the NDS Association website at nds-association.org. Deep links are also shown on the slide I'm sharing right now. Like last time, this webinar will be recorded and the shared uh, version is then on our website along with the slides. Once available, we will make a post on the NDS LinkedIn channel and on our website as well. This is the third of our four-part webinar series on NDS Live, and we kept what's probably the best for last. On March 25th, we're doing the fourth webinar, and it is all about why layering map data by freshness and use cases makes so much sense in how to then deliver these layers the smart way to cloud systems and vehicles with NDS Live. Please join us again on March 25th. You will find a link to register for this session on the NDS Association website. With me today uh, is Otto Niro, Product Manager at NNG. Otto and I know each other for, for five years now, uh, working together on NDS topics in the association. I'm super happy. He's going to share some exciting stuff today that he and his team is uh, working on. My name is Philip Robertus. I'm a senior product manager here for automotive products and web applications. I hope you're sitting comfortably with a tea, coffee, water, or juice nearby for the next 16 minutes. Here's an overview of what we will cover today. First, I will share what ISA, the upcoming intelligent speed assistance regulation is and why it needs map data. Then I will hand over to Otto, who will share how to minimize ASA map data consumption with NDS Live. And then we have reserved time for your questions. You can ask them anytime in the Q&A box, and we will then select you to ask your question live and ideally with your video switched on. And no worries if you have a bad hair day or don't feel comfortable asking questions live, simply ask anyway in the Q&A box and add a short note that you want us <coughs> to read and then answer your questions, and we will do so. Now, since this webinar is about NDS Live, I will quickly introduce you to NDS and the NDS Association. NDS is short for Navigation Data Standard, and it is the worldwide standard for map data in automotive ecosystems. NDS maps work worldwide and are globally adopted. NDS offers a well-defined spec for how to store map data, and it allows flexibility for customized user experiences. The NDS specification covers the data model, storage format, interfaces, and protocols. NDS is for in-vehicle navigation and ADAS. It is for mobile companion apps, connected car cloud solutions, and for automated driving. It evolves with the market needs as NDS is for the automotive industry by the automotive industry. The NDS Association was founded in 2009 by OEMs, application service map data, and compilation providers and NDS-based products are available in the market since 2012 and used globally in ADAS and navigation systems. And development on the OEM side to use NDS for level three drive automation is well underway. Over 30 automotive OEM brands are using NDS maps today. The advantage of an industry standard like NDS is that it creates broad consensus in our industry for the best path forward made by the best engineers and experts available from multiple companies. Standardization consortia may not be known for a fast pace. However, market driving associations by like-minded companies, as it is the case with NES, demonstrated to have the right speed for the market. We started two years ago working on an evolution of NDS that is smarter when bringing map data into connected cars and that keeps the cost of that connectivity in mind. The result of this evolution is NDS Live. Today, we're going to illustrate how NDS Live works using ISA, the Intelligent Speed Assistance Systems, that will be mandatory in Europe soon. ISA is a topic that needs fresh map data brought into vehicles over a data connection so that consumers don't have to struggle with manual updates. 
And at the same time, this needs to be done with the cost of data consumption in mind. So let me give you some background and context on ISA first before we go deeper into the possibilities and advantages of NDS live based solutions. The European Commission's Transport Council has set up a road safety group and they defined the goal Vision Zero, which aims to reduce road death by almost zero by 2050. ISA is defined as a mandatory in vehicle system that shall support drivers with complying with the speed limits everywhere on any European road. It's a term used for various possible implementations. I'll share some examples with you. Definite ISA test requirements and timelines are still being finalized by the European Commission. What is already known is that ISA will become mandatory in all passenger cars, light commercial vehicles, trucks, and buses. There's a two-stage rollout of the European Union ISA regulation. The first stage is scheduled for July 2022, when new vehicle types require ISA. These are new models launched in Europe that require type approval or homologation. The second stage then launches in July 2024. Then all newly registered vehicles within the European Union must include ISA as a standard line fit. According to the latest version, the following types of speed limits are in scope. Explicit speed limits that are signposted, as well as the variable speed limits often found on displays across uh, the motorways. And then there are the implicit speed limits. These are generally country or regional speed limit regulations. Excluded from the regulation test criteria are conditional speed limits, for example, the ones that are time and weather dependent. But be aware that the driver experience may be well more important than the regulation. If a car shows a speed limit as part of the ISA feature that is not reflecting the actual legal speed limit because it doesn't take the conditional rules into account, then that probably leads to consumer dissatisfaction and maybe a speeding ticket for the driver. So in addition to the 27 countries, Norway and Switzerland and as well uh, the UK are very likely to go into make the ISA regulation a country uh, law as well. Now, the European regulation comes with the need for the OEMs to pass tests and then that results in an approval to sell vehicles in the European market. The approval requirement is a 90% target to correctly apply the legal speed limit uh, to the ISA feature. And we understand this will be tested during the test drives before a vehicle start of production, and tests will also be repeated during the vehicle's production time. Uh, there are defined conditions for these test drives, and uh, you can read them on the summary on the slide here. Uh, I'm not going into the details here as the regulation is not entirely fine yet. Now, um, how does that intelligent speed assistance look like to a driver? An ISA system needs to show the legal speed limit to the driver at all times and in direct line of sight. That is the minimum uh, requirement. It is, if it's using an electronic horizon, can show speed limits in the display before the driver can even see them. Uh, and in addition to displaying the speed limit, it may be or flash when you go over the allowed speed. As an advanced implementation, it may be more active in that the vehicle supports you in not going over the speed limit by not translating pressure on the accelerator paddle into more speed once you reach the speed limit. Or it may automatically adapt the set speed of advanced cruise control systems. Whether it's passive or active, ISA directly affects the driver user experience. Remember, as a minimum, it is visible at all times. If the speed uh, limit applied is not reflecting reality, the driver may be going too fast or too slow. In all implementations, it may be still be possible for the driver to choose to switch the system on or off. Now that we've talked about the ISA regulation and you've seen an example of how this looks like uh, to drivers, let's talk about why map data is required for ISA solutions. Why does it need a map and can't just use a camera system, you may ask? Well, because for one, there's a lot of non-posted speed limits. And then second, speed limit signs can be hard to read. On this slide, you see some typical challenging situations that camera systems are facing. Speed limits are not or badly visible. Bad weather or light conditions are challenging, and it can be as simple as foliage growth, overhanging speed limits, snow covering signs, or simply the lack of infrastructure maintenance. The smaller conditional uh, signs can also be hard to read. 
in the uh, right upper corner, you see such an example. And uh, as I said earlier, these conditional signs are not part of the regulation, uh, the test criteria, uh, but they are part of the driver's user experience. Um, and a map would typically include these, right? So that is why uh, we, the NDS Association members, the companies, and others in the automotive industry, we are sure that you need a map because the European Union has defined that the test approval criteria has this 90% success rate. And if that's not reached, the vehicle doesn't get the approval to be sold. So again, explicit speed limits that are signposted can be detected by camera-based system. But as I showed you, this is not always easy. Map data helps as an additional reference or sensor. And then we have a whole other category of speed limits, the implicit ones that are not showing a speed limit as part of the sign, or they are speed limits that are simply not signposted at all. And these are, for example, the default country level speed limits for motorways, urban roads, build up areas, living or play streets. The non posted speed limits can also be conditional. For example, speed limits may depend on whether a road is paved or not, how many lanes a road has, or they can be weather dependent. In France, for example, uh, the speed limit on motorways when it rains is 110 kilometers per hour instead of 130, uh, or they are time based. In the Netherlands, you can drive a little faster on motorways at night. And also note that in Europe, it's very easy and sometimes seamless to cross country borders without border checkpoints and very limited signage. So crossing a border means the speed limit rules change. The non-posted implicit speed limits are very common, as you can see in the graphic based on research data by here. In the northern European countries, you find a high density of posted speed limits, but in the middle and south of Europe, the posted speed limits become less dense. And across Europe, these speed limits are not the same. <coughs> Excuse me. As I shared earlier, um, the change, they, you know, the, they change with the time of day, weather conditions, or number of lanes for the same road category. And of course, um, speed limits are different by vehicle type. So in summary, ISA systems will not work well enough when they're not relying, uh, when they're only relying on camera systems. Map data provides real value as the source for speed limits when signs are not present, or as a reference and second sensor to validate camera detected speed limits. And you don't just need map data. We believe you need this data to be regularly updated because speed limits do change at an average rate of 10% per year across Europe. And countrywide regulations can also change, <clears throat> like they did in France uh, in 2019 or in the Netherlands just last year. So not only do you want map data in support of ISA, <laughs> you also want up-to-date map data. And you want a great user experience. Uh, you see, I'm, I'm a bit selfish here. When I visit my parents, I want to spend quality time with them. I already have to fix their phones and then their laptops, and I don't want to also update them up in their car because it's so complicated. And then you have consumers that have grown up with digital connected devices as part of their life, and they simply expect technology to seamlessly support them, and they will not understand in case they need to do a manual update of their car by USB stick to keep that ISA feature working to their expectation. And that is exactly where NDS Live-based solutions will provide a lot of benefits. And Otto will explain this uh, in more detail. But before I hand over to Otto, allow me to briefly highlight the market needs for data in a more general way. Today, map data needs to be in much more detailed, precise, and fresher to support assistance, navigation, and automated driving functions. Cars are now equipped with data connectivity and map data can be updated and streamed over the app. Selected features are powered and delivered by cloud systems. Not everything is done by the in-vehicle system any longer. Vehicle assistance and navigation features work on cloud systems and on in-vehicle systems alike. What's also happening is that automotive platforms span over more and more models as OEMs are looking for greater scale and cost efficiencies. And EV platforms will only accelerate this trend. What it means is that the features needing map data span from fairly basic universal features that need a road network to more specialized features, 
So for example, from intelligent speed assistance to Acer features, to basic navigation, to premium navigation, up into drive automation. With reducing the number of systems and ECUs down to one, we also acknowledge that bringing different data sets with overlaps of map data attributes into vehicle, that doesn't make sense anymore from a cost and data management perspective. So all that data has to travel over a data connection, which creates cost. A modular approach is needed that allows map data layers to be consumed by cars according to their active feature set, while the architecture of the underlying system scales across the entire portfolio of features. And there is data that has very different shelf life. Some of that data doesn't need to be updated often. Map display data, like cargo features, 3D landmarks, or digital terrain model are examples here. And there is data that changes more often and needs frequent updates. And there's data that you need in near real time, and the system uses this only once. So understanding data shelf life and offering ways to consume and store data differently has a big impact on data consumption and data transfer cost. So we use what you can, but keep dynamic and live, live data in as small as possible containers. And with NDS Live, the specification now supports these new requirements and use cases and thus combines the best of our experience with today's realities and tomorrow's new possibilities. And that's why we say NDS Live is not a database, it's a distributed map data system. So NDS Live is really now the worldwide standard for distributed map data in connected automotive ecosystems. It is built on the long experience of leading automotive OEMs, system vendors, and map data providers. Two years ago, the over 40 NDS member companies started looking at the evolving needs of connected cars, where software plays a major role in the consumer user experience. What's clear is that in our globalized market, with its modular and scalable architecture, with embedded and cloud-based systems, with driver assistance leading to drive automation, we need to properly support all this in a better way than it was possible with the NDS Classic specification. Modular and self-contained to minimize data consumption, downloading and caching data, enabling both embedded vehicle software and cloud systems. NDS Live was officially launched last year in September, and uh, several NDS association member companies are actively developing this to be production grade this year. Otto and his team at NNG are actively working on driving the development of NDS Live forward and using their experience with NDS streaming and minimizing data consumption. So I'm handing over to Otto now and let him talk about the details of how to minimize data consumption using NDS Live map data services. And we're switching slides now, so, and Otto will take over. Thank you, Philip. And hello, everyone. Uh, at NNG, we have been working on prototyping NDS Live use cases. And out of these POCs, I will show you some examples how um, uh, that's regarding uh, ISA. And the focus will be on how to minimize uh, data consumption. So you, you probably remember this slide from the previous webinar when the smart layer concept of NDS Live was introduced. Smart layers enables the service to freely combine data layers like road, lane, speed limits, and ADAS, and distribute them to different car lines based on uh, required functionality. For example, when it comes to ISA, only road and speed limit layers needs to be distributed, and they can be packed either as ties or paths. I will demonstrate to you today how these smart layers can be streamed and how they enable an ISA solution to reduce data consumption. So let's start with the, with the most simple scenario for ISA use case. What we need is just a service in the cloud that delivers the smart layer tiles. And the client application that consumes the tiles in the car and distribute the speed limit info to the cluster or to the head up display. It is simple as we don't have any pre-installed map on board. Everything is requested and cached on demand. 
Let's see how it looks like in a client application. At first, we don't have any map available on board, just a car position in the middle of nowhere. This is, this is how we roll out our new car from the dealer. However, it is expected to get the speed limit information shortly. When the first GPS signal is received and online connection is available, the client requests a smart layer tile around the car position. Only the road layer and the speed limit attributes are streamed. The speed limit signs on the screen are rendered based on the cached data. When the tile is downloaded, it is used for instant map matching so that we can get speed limit info at the car position. As soon as the car starts moving and the system can calculate the most probable path, this will trigger additional tile streaming for the horizon. So when the car is approaching the tiles border, the next tile is being downloaded and cached for continuous map matching and horizon generation. This is a kind of edge case now because uh, uh, this is not only the, the uh, tile border, but it's the corner of the border. So we have to download it, uh, all the surrounding tile, tiles. Speed limit changes are also displayed accordingly to the cache data. Next to speed limit warning, you can see the simulation speed. In the download counter, you can see the accumulated data consumption by streaming the tiles in the corridor. NDS Live supports the functionality of requesting a list of tiles as well and using them for pre-caching. Like in this case, longer paths is calculated and the smart layer tiles are streamed as a long horizon, requesting up to 10 tiles in front of the car. When deviating from the calculated paths, a new long horizon is generated instantly. This long horizon helps anticipating connectivity white zones. In some rural areas, the cellular network coverage may not be suitable to download the next tile in the corridor, but pre-caching some tiles up front can reach these connectivity white zones. Besides a long horizon, a wider corridor can be also streamed along the car. In rural areas, where the size of the tiles are not that significant, let's say less than 10 kilobytes, downloading a list of tiles in a wider corridor may be recommended. It can be also used for building a so-called home area by, by pre-caching frequently used tiles based on user profile, like daily routes, commuting routes, and so on. But why would you download the whole tile? While most of the roads are never used, especially when it comes to ISA, when we only need speed limit information. It is possible to get the pass with the speed limit info. Why not? Just think about it. We only need speed limit info for ISA. Who cares about the rest of the data? The way how NDS Live is designed enables us even this unique scenario. What is the real motivation of OEMs with ISA? To get better NCAP ratings and meet the ISA requirements with minimal cost. And minimal cost means minimal data consumption as well. So I made some comparison on the data consumption between streaming the smart layer tiles on the left side and smart layer paths on the right side. In the urban areas with dense network, dense road network, the difference is quite huge. The, the pass, the smart layer pass, can be 30 or 40 times smaller than a tile. When it comes to rural areas, the difference is not that huge, but still significant. A pass can be up to 10, 10 times smaller than the tiles. Before showing some use cases with that, let's have a look at the technical details how smart layer pass can be delivered. In this case, we need to offload the brain of the solution into the cloud. That's the online horizon assist. It is in charge of online map matching and horizon generation. But it requires map 
for calculating the most probable paths. So this horizon assist fetches the required, the required ties from the smartly attached service. Now, the onboard client is able to send the position and the heading information to the horizon assist. Then it retrieves uh, the MPP, the calculated most probable path has a sequence of coordinates, but still it has no speed limit info. So how can we get that? NNG set up an additional smart layer service, smart, uh, sorry, smart layer pass service that uses the map from the tie service. It's like a proxy service. This smart layer pass service fetches the data uh, based on the retrieved MPP, the most probable pass, and streams it to the car. This patch data includes the road geometry, topology, and speed limit info as well. Then the client application delivers the speed limit info uh, to the cluster or to the head-up display. In case, the client in case the client application is able to get a route from a mirroring system, then it can be also used for fetching the smart layer pass without requesting the MPP from the online, online Horizon Assist. So let's see how this looks like in the client application. We start again with an empty cache. When the car starts moving, the first path is streamed instantly. The size of this path is only one kilobyte. All the required map information is cached for the path including the speed limit info. When, devi when deviating from the original pass, a new pass is streamed immediately. As you can see, the previous pass remains there. It can be persistently cached and reused later if needed. I know that this solution might raise some questions. So in case you have any, keep them to the QAA. One of, the use, one of the use case with the smart layer pass uh, is how to get dynamic speed limit info. It was actually one of the initial idea behind this concept. For simulating this scenario, I used the same route from the previous video, but in this case, we already have tile cached and we request the dynamic speed limit info from a, info from a different source like the vari variable speed limits that are often found on gentries across the motorways. According to the latest scope of the ISA regulation, it will be also a requirement to use this dynamic speed limit. Now let's make a comparison between the smart layer ties on the left and the smart layer paths on the right by streaming the map. You can see fundamental difference uh, between the two approaches and its impact on the data consumption that is quite huge. In this example, I simulate the same route and when approaching to the tie border, the next tile and the pass is streamed. However, due to fast simulation speed, it may happen that we cannot get the pass in, in time when deviating from the route. This is an edge case where speed limit display might not be seamless. So how can we overcome this problem? Here we are. So we improve the concept and edit stops for the pass. These stops are selected topologically and not spatially. It means that prohibited turns are excluded by fetching the data. In this example, we set a 50 meter threshold for selecting the stops and caching a wider pass as a corridor. It also helps um, for improving the, the onboard map machine. The size of this pass is a little bit larger, though it is still 10 times smaller than the full tile. This is how we can win against high uh, 
data consumption. And ultimately, the speed limit info can be seamlessly provided even if we deviate from the path. Smartly a pass can be also used as a fallback when bandwidth drops. For example, when approaching the tile border, we may not be able to stream the tile due to its size. In this case, the system can fall back to smartly a pass that requires much less data to download. And once we have full connectivity again, we can fetch the whole tile if needed. And this is the last use case for today. You probably already have an eHorizon solution that makes use of pre-installed databases. And maybe you wonder how you can reuse it by leveraging the benefit of NDS Live. Let's look at an example. Blue lines represent the pre-installed database that is in NDS Classic format. It includes most of the data required for ISA but it is not fresh enough to support, for example, the daily speed limit updates or even dynamic speed limits. By NDS Live um, can stream, uh, uh, so with NDS Live, we can stream smart layer paths on top of the pre-installed NDS Classic map. Um, the benefit of this scenario that uh, you could also reuse the onboard matching, map matching, and horizon generation. So the most, prob most probable path can be calculated on the pre-installed map and, and request the smart layer pass to update the map. Not only speed limits, but also the road geometry uh, can be cached. And uh, yeah, the road geometry is cached and uh, uh, there is no need for implementing a complex uh, pre-caching mechanism as the pre-installed map can still be used as a safe fallback to provide seamless speed limit info. By combining this uh, solution with smart layer pass, we can provide always the latest speed limit info with, the, with uh, minimal data consumption. Yeah, and actually we are open to ideas and working with them together with you. If you are an NDS member, you can always join our NDS Live Dev team. Thank you for your attention, attention. And I give the word back to you, Philip. Yeah, thank you, Otto. Um, we're now going into the interactive part of our webinar. I hope you found uh, it's very interesting uh, what Otto presented. If you have questions, uh, you can either submit them in the Q&A window uh, or ask them live. So you need to raise your hand, for example, and then your question uh, will be answered by our panel of experts. So let me welcome our panelists, uh, Otto Niro, product manager at NNG. Then we have George Blahut, who's a principal engineer at NNG. We have Danny Sulz, uh, a product leader at NavInfo. Nico Glorius, uh, product manager at Nav Info and also vice chairman of the NDS Association, and Fabian Klebert, who's the technical coordinator for the NDS Association, and Boris Gumpold, uh, senior manager engineering of automotive publications at HERE, and also the technical chairman of the NDS Association, and then myself, uh, Philip Hubertus, product manager automotive products at HERE. Um, as I said, you can be on the panel too, submit your questions in the Q&A box and we'll add you to the panel, ideally with video, uh, and then you can ask your question. So we've had uh, two questions already about the recording uh, and slides, uh, and I've already answered them in the Q&A chat box. Um, we're going to post this on the NDS website. Uh, the slides will be available for download and the recording as well. So you can share that uh, with your colleagues later as well. Good. So far, Fabian, do you see hand raises or questions? I don't. No, not yet. Still quite. I uh, think probably the uh, 
uh, the the presentation by Otto was quite impressive. So uh, <laughs> seems like there's no questions left. So, but here we go. First questions are dropping in now. So for everyone who, like we said before, for everyone who likes to be live on the uh, on air, just simply raise your hand and we'll make you a panelist. And then it would be great if you can turn on the video, we can talk. But of course, like uh, Philip said already, we can also uh, read out your questions. So um, then let's start with that. Uh, we have one from Matthias. He's, uh, he asked, is the size of the tiles fixed or can it change dynamically? So if this is, maybe I'll, as the technical coordinator, I take the liberty to, to answer that. If I understand it correctly, the, the question is whether the, the really the size of the tile, so the, the, the geospatial size, right? Geospatial size in NDS of, of the tiles is fixed. So it's a fixed tiling schema. And so, so basically, of course, the size, the data size, then, then uh, uh, just scales with the density of data that you can find inside there. Good, then we have another question from Edward Mark. How would the NDS Live Smart Layer be able to adjust? Um, that is, so basically the, the layers the layers are pre-compiled or, or maybe also, uh, or, or others on the panel, if you have a, an idea on how these, uh, so, so the thing is, the smart layer, we've seen that in the very first um, um, pages for, from Otto, the, the, uh, the, on the server side, you basically uh, uh, pre-configure what's going to be in, right? So they're not dynamically adjusting to the surroundings or so. You simply say, okay, we have speed limits, we're going to have the road geometry, or and we're going to have the road topology. And basically, that's it. So you, you configure them up front. And so they're not adjusting dynamically, if that was the question. Maybe let me add that um, depending on the feature set needs, the, the map data attribute need that you have, which can be different depending on uh, your feature set. You know, For ISA, you probably need road topology, speed limits, and a few road attributes. If you want to go a little further into more ADAS functionality, you may need a few more uh, attributes. What we're, what NDS Live enables is that on the map data provider side, we can configure data layers that we then group up into smart layers. And there's a, a small customization possibility there, basically, that allows us to pre-compile data and then serve it up into a smart layer. And that is adjustable. So if that was uh, the background of your question, then um, yeah, I think I think he added some more some more details to the question later on uh, in, the, in the Q and A. I've seen. So maybe the, the the question wasn't complete. So it was more like um, to be adjusted to present multiple data sources in real time. So um, I think the smart layer maybe. Uh, Maybe Otto, you can you can explain a little on the on the difference uh, different vendors you also had uh, in in the presentation. Yeah, so in in this demo we used uh, two different sources, two different services, and 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 also uh, another source as a as a uh, pre-installed NDS classic database. And regarding the the smart layer tie services, so we evaluated and used uh, here and and Navinfo. Uh, services that utilizing completely different map sources, and uh, uh, we also wanted to to, to assess or or, or uh, prototype how we can combine uh, two different services as well. So let's let's take an, uh, an example. We take uh, the road geometry, the road uh, layers from here, and how we can we get dynamic speed limit from a different source. Let's say this is not coming uh, from, uh, from Navinfo. But uh, so with NDS Live, it is actually quite easy. We can, uh, we can uh, get access to, to, to different services. Uh, one of them can be streamed as a tile, the other one as a path, and we do the uh, magic on the client 
to to match the two different sources and and use it for for generating a speed limit info something like that so okay. we have most likely a pass here depends to navigation route or MPP or MPP and sub pass. Maybe George. Hmm. Okay, so Philip. We, we also have this other, I think the, the, they're both quite interesting. Um, hmm. So, for instance, there's the other question with uh, is the map matching and the rerouting being handled in the back end? Maybe this is something, uh, George, because he, he actually implemented what you've seen all today. So uh, he can answer this best, I guess. The uh, demo that you see was uh, the MPP calculation and the map matching was based on the NDS classic map, and uh, which was which was depicted by uh, blue lines. And on top of that, you got uh, this from the server you got the NDS live uh, uh, pass. It's also possible to put the whole thing into the cloud, the whole map matching and uh, MPP generation, that's another use case. Good, thanks. Um, another question, how, how often is the NDS Live road data updated? Daily, monthly, yearly? Maybe this is some, some question to the map vendors in the room. Nico, yeah, that's, go ahead. Yeah, sure, <laughs> I can. So this is uh, totally up to you. So you can, you can. Yeah, it's basically based on on the raw data availability, and you have uh, you can have different types of uh, of data in your NDS Live uh, layers. So you can have uh, basically, uh, let's say, static and uh, versioned uh, data, which is typically the road network, road network, for example. Um, then you have uh, Dynamic data, which has a certain lifespan, um, for example, a road closure or something like that. And then you can have even live data and maybe a, a different layer, which is um, yeah that up, updated that frequently that it doesn't even make sense to persist it anymore. And we also have uh, different versioning concepts for, for these three types of uh, yeah, freshness. So it's it's up to you, and it's uh, basically totally up to the raw data suppliers. Yeah, yeah Philip. Yeah, I think you you probably agree that for us, for map uh, providers, it's fairly easy to do uh, updates on a more frequent basis. But it comes with the cost of do you want that those updates to be brought into the car? So as I shared earlier, uh, this um, the shelf life is important to understand and how often you want to update each of the layers, right? So some of that data may be totally fine to just update once a month, and then you bring fresher data on top of that. Um, also, there's ways to do incremental updates, so you don't have to update whole tiles, but only uh, parts of it. Um, and you can layer data that is that needs more freshness. For example, um, speed limits that are coming from construction sites um, or that just uh, were installed um, earlier, you know, during during a week or a month, those can be served up in a separate layer and then brought into the vehicle with a higher freshness cadence. Um, so for us, for the, for the map data processing side, it's fairly easy to do uh, daily updates or hourly updates. I think we all do this for HD map data, for example, already, but the, all that data would need to be consumed. And that is where uh, you need to decide on the OEM system and the side and how much uh, how big your data bill uh, for each of the vehicles needs to become. Okay, thanks. So um, there's another question from Martin asking, does NDS Live support lane dependent speed limits? Do we need the lane level positioning for to meet ISA regulations. 
So that is maybe a question to the uh, ISO specialists in the call. Like, Philip, you introduced us to this. Do you know anything about ISO regulations on lane uh, specific speed limits? Yeah, so lane specific speed limits are not part of the regulation as far as I know from the text of the regulation itself. Uh, but remember, um, what's in the regulation may not be as important as the user experience. So, um, and, and to be honest, lane dependent speeds can be both, right? They can be on variable speed signs, so they are displayed overhead, uh, the motorways, um, and the cameras would be able to detect them. But you have the tricky case when, for example, uh, exit uh, lanes have a different speed limit. And that's then posted on a fixed sign on the side of the road. And there's this little conditional sign that underneath that says this speed limit applies to the exit lane. And as I said earlier, these conditional signs are not part of the regulation. Now imagine what happens if the vehicle detects that speed limit sign and thinks the camera detects it and thinks it's for the entire road, but you actually don't want to take the exit. You want to go straight. And you have a more advanced system running uh, where uh, you have an ACC, an advanced cruise control, that adapts to the posted speed limits. Would that then break you down uh, while you could theoretically go straight ahead with 130, but the sign says 60? Uh, would that break you down? I think that's a very good use case on why we believe map data is so important and where we can model the independent uh, speed limits in the map data so you have that as an additional reference and second sensor uh, to make sure that the features and the customer experience is, uh, is great. Yeah. And to answer the first part of the question, yes, NDS Live does support uh, lane level speed limits. Good. There is a... So we did the rerouting that got two votes. There's another question again on the different sources of data, one for the map which is on board in the vehicle and another one for speed limits that shows that there's a, what ensures, that's a question, what ensures that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the map data and the speed limit data? Can there be, and now, where did it go? Popped up. Can there be situations where yeah. speed limits exist for roads that do not exist on the map data? So, so if you have, Two one data is the relationship between two different sources, right? And the other one is, can there be differences? So, uh, you, you want to get, uh, sorry. You wanna go? Yeah, well, okay. basically, uh, because of this reason, we also have uh, mechanisms to um, at, at least have uh, weak references in so that you are not completely dependent on the road data. So, I would. Uh, Think that in a typical use case where you are providing a speed limit service combined with road data, then of course it will always match one to one because you have direct references and you're sending the roads together with the speed limits. Uh, you could also have a, a speed limit service where basically you use a weak referencing me uh, mechanisms, which are also um, defined in NDS Live, where you are not dependent on that. And in that case, of course, it could potentially happen um, if you. If, if your the road data that you are using is is outdated, for example, uh, but yeah, typically you want to make sure that that's um, also as fresh as possible, which also depends on uh, whether or not you're going into self-driving functions or more infotainment solutions. Um, yeah, that was my remark on this. Yeah, and as you as you as you could see, for instance, another solution is simply like like Otto showed. Um, getting this minimal set of road data along with it and the road geometry, right? Because the, you've seen it wasn't like only getting speed limits in the smart layer path. So, but it also took that important part of the road geometry. So basically, uh, there's no need to match it one to one in that case, right? So, and, and that is, and that is, of course, a benefit. So you simply only have to only have to match your car data on that small path, and only if you need to fall back, uh, if there's no connection going on, like Otto showed, and then we we we're driving into the blue part, then we we simply matching to uh, another source and and using the old data. So I think we, we we have seen a very clever solution to that problem today. Good. So now the questions are 
really dropping in. Um, Yeah, I think that also should should answer the question, does any life offer some help for matching data between life and static data? For instance, road segments, routes, or is it just geolocation and the magic is left up to the client? So yep, map matching is still, um, I, I, like uh, George said, uh, you can do the map matching either in the car or in the cloud, but it doesn't go away. Also not with any life. So what else do we have? Ah, yeah, that's, uh, Danny, you picked one, right? How to solve the concern that streaming while AD function is on would probably be, bring risks on the automated driving system stability. Yeah, so my uh, remark on that one would be that, yeah, this is not an uh, NDS Live specific issue, but if I understand the question correctly, more a general issue with uh, you introduce the internet into the car uh, if you're using auto drive functions, so you have a dependency to that. Um, so I, th I think generally, as I said, not any slide specific, but there are multiple things you can do to uh, reduce the risk there, of course. Eh? Uh, so, for example, you need to make sure that you have uh, sufficient uh, caching of data. Well, first of all, let me say that I think uh, this, this internet access is anyway uh, something that you need to do because it is so crucial for auto driving functions that you have fresh data, that you have up-to-date data. So you anyway have to have a channel to get this. And if you are introducing this, uh, of course, uh, you have to make sure that you have sufficient caching in the system that you can handle dropouts or um, areas where you have uh, insufficient coverage um, in there. Um, and yeah, uh, also make sure that when you request data, you uh, have sufficient buffer there. So that that's one way to do it. And of course, also if you're having an actual project with a supplier, you can uh, in the project itself do some arrangements with regards to SLAs and uptime and, and these kind of things. So basically, it's more like you have to do it. So you have a couple of things you can do to make sure that uh, it's as stable as possible. Which is not NDS life specific, but something you just, which is inherent in the in the auto drive systems that we have. So I hope that answers the question. Good. We have also one. We have a lot of interesting questions here. I, let's see if we can get through them all together. So there is one um, that asks, uh, "What's the?" That got upvoted, yes. So that's this where it is. Um, for instance, is ISA requiring an offline database to be installed in the vehicle? So, for example, a small map database containing the minimum set to run, or is it acceptable to work with this online streaming data? The regulation itself doesn't uh, foresee any uh, technical requirements, so it's completely technology agnostic. It doesn't dictate on how to solve the problem. It basically just says you need to have 90% of speed limits uh, applied uh, during the test drives. So it's up to you and how you solve it. Uh, you can do it both ways. There are some OEMs who believe that uh, the cost of maintaining an online solution for what's currently seven or 14 years uh, of maintenance that is uh, part of the regulation, uh, you know, maintaining such an online uh, solution for that long is too costly. So they believe um, in an offline map solution. Um, and then there's another camp that looks at um, an online solution because it's just better for the user experience that the user doesn't have to do anything uh, and the data is brought to the car over the air uh, without any manual updates or triggers. And in that scenario, you can do both. You can do uh, larger caching of data, uh, or you can do a stream solution like Auto Short, where you really just bring the data into a car when you need it. And I think there's another question that was around how can you determine the connectivity? And uh, I don't see it in the Q&A yet, but let's say we, uh, at here we have a product that's called uh, Cellular Signals uh, that allows you to understand the connectivity on every road uh, in the map. So there's an attribute that allows you to understand the connectivity across different carriers and signal uh, types. 
And maybe also two, two remarks to, to the first question again. So as you also highlighted uh, earlier, Philip, I think it's not only about the regulation, right? So it's really about the, the user experience. So it might help with uh, getting your car approved that you um, pass the test drive. But um, if you're later on having then problems in the field, that doesn't help you much. Um, so I think uh, for various reasons, uh, which you also have highlighted already, a uh, map is uh, really recommended for that one. And um, yeah, it's also referred to, to dropouts regarding uh, to tunnels. Then, of course, you can have uh, intelligent uh, caching strategy. I think Otto already also um, showed a little bit in that direction. So you're looking up front what uh, is ahead of you. Either you are taking this uh, signal strength information into account, which you uh, mentioned, Philip, or you are looking into other road attributes um, like uh, tunnels and so on. So this is then totally up to you. Hey, good, thanks. Hope that answers this question. Uh, there's another one. Uh, what is the data size ratio over the road layer versus the speed limit layer? So maybe that's one for the data provider that actually provided the data because Otto just simply showed the numbers completely together. Mm -hmm. I don't know, can we, can, can we say anything about that? So when, when, when we stream the data, we, we also logged the, the, the layer separately, I mean the sizes. And uh, let's take an example when the whole uh, smart layer ties, the size was, was let's say 100 kilobyte, then the speed limit layers, only the speed limit uh, layer was about um, five kilobyte or something like that. Mm, so, so the most things are like topology and geometry and stuff. Topology, geometry, and and the the functional road classes and and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks for this. Uh, another interesting: any privacy issues when the vehicle is sending the MPP and the position information to a NDS Life system? <laughs> I don't know if we can answer that, but uh, I think we're all aware that this is that this may be an issue, in, especially also in some legislations. So, um, but does anybody in the panel can make? Well, we, well, we typically recommend is that uh, on the OEM side, on the client side, you use a shared uh, shared access credentials uh, among uh, many vehicles. So basically, you can't identify a single client or vehicle. So, so the requests get anonymized yeah. uh, already. Mm -hmm. It's it's so, quite similar to, to the online routing service when when the car uh, sends basically the position and the heading information. So the same, same applies. No. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe we can also pick one question about quality checks. I saw that one. So, so for example, in the S Classic, we already have a, a validation framework in place for taking care of, of validation and certification. And we are currently also working on, on a corresponding tooling for NDS Live. Um, the main goal of this tooling is, um, however, to ensure integrity of, of the data structures and, and that the service is working uh, according to the, the specification of NDS Live. Um, we also have uh, rule sets in there, then uh, most likely regarding um, connectivity, so that, um, for example, uh, I don't know, the number of lanes on the one end of the of the connected link matches the one on the, on the next link and, and stuff like that. So these are things we, we are checking with the official tooling. Um, you, of course, can also enhance this uh, tooling later on with own uh, test cases, um, which may be project-specific or which are more related to um, data quality itself. But the NDS itself is, is not checking the, the quality of the underlying uh, map data. So that's out of scope of our certification. But we're providing the, the tooling to support you in doing that. And Nico, and the tooling is, is actually something that's developed by the NDS Association, uh, paid Correct. for the membership uh, fees of the members and then made available. So it's a benefit of becoming a member that you get access to uh, tools um, 
not only the certification bench, but also visualization tools and other tools for development. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. Hey, thanks. There was one, also one interesting question. It doesn't really touch the ISA stuff, but I wanted to pick that one, that one out. Otto, you showed, uh, here's a, one question. In your slide, there's a scenario utilizing a broad in device navigation, right? So as the minimum use case you showed. Is there any idea how to capture the navigation route from these utilizing uh, to, to get it from the smart layer path? So uh, we, we, we see it as, as a requirements in, in some, some added queues that uh, somehow we need to get access to, to external routes like that's, it, that's coming from, from the mirroring system. By default, for, for the ISO regulation, uh, uh, so utilizing mirroring system is out of scope because the, the car shall, uh, shall be checked as it is delivered uh, uh, from the car dealer. But um, yeah, so in case uh, uh, the end user is using uh, its mirroring system uh, for the daily routes or, or for, for commuting or for whatever reason, uh, we might get the route through an interface and, and, uh, and the route is quite similar to the MPP that we, the, that we calculate. So uh, based on the route, we can make a sequence of, of uh, coordinates and then send it to the smart layer pass service to fetch the pass. So that's all. It's not a rocket science. The only question is uh, whether we can get access to uh, a route from, from a mirror system. And just from an NDS perspective, this is on the roadmap to, to deal with this, this issue is on the roadmap of the product definition group in, in uh, NDS. Uh, looking into this, how can we, for instance, yeah, how, how can we get to that route? Because that would need probably some interfaces in in car, uh, whatever CarPlay or or Android Auto or whatever that we really getting this from any navigation that you bring in. Um, so we would need a standardized way on how to access this. There's nothing like this at the moment, uh, which any, any which would be publicly available. Um, but um, yeah, we have it on the roadmap, and it's for sure uh, an interesting uh, because it will be one of the next steps, right? So, so we probably have to really do that. Thanks. Good. We have another one: latency, update latency, or giving given the LTE technology. What is the what are the latency requirements for NDS use cases or the ISA use cases? Do we, can we share anything on that? Do we know this or is this depending on the customer in the end? No, well, we showed a very, very short uh, distance where the ties were streamed, but this, this was just for demo purposes. In reality, you will uh, get the route like kilometers ahead, uh, download the, the pass well ahead. So latency is not, not really an issue here. It, uh, from from the demo, you you could see that uh, almost uh, you were almost at, at the tie border when the next one arrived. But that was just for showcasing to fit the whole concept in one screen because it would be hard to see that what happens like uh, ten kilometers ahead. You can you can have theoretically like a ten kilometer long MPP and download all the all the passes uh, up up front. Uh, only only problem is when you deviate from your route. And uh, for that, you will calculate uh, the possible time which you need to download the tile or a pass. And uh, for the uh, stops which you saw earlier, that we also uh, stream some some parts of the uh, road network which are not on the main pass. And uh, those those small stops has to be long enough to be able to get the uh, uh, next next pass in, in the client. But uh, actually, that's, since the pass is very small, it's it's very quick. So you don't have to stream a very long uh, stop for that to be able to uh, stream anything. Okay, good. Thank you. So um, I don't know. We have to also look a little bit on the time. I think we're a little bit over time already. Um, Philip, I'll leave it up to you as the host to uh, pick the final uh, question and then. 
and then we maybe have to close this down. And thanks everybody who's putting in the questions. It's really great and appreciate it. And uh, I'm sorry that we cannot answer all of them today. Yeah, thanks Fabian. Uh, I think there's one last one that once again talks about uh, the combination and liveliness of NHS life. And uh, Salomon Berger has asked here, how about electric display frequent speed limit changes, for example, during traffic jams? So I believe what you mean is what happens if there is a variable speed sign uh, over the multiple lanes um, that displays a speed limit. Um, I think this can be solved uh, in two ways, uh, in either a combination of both, actually. So you need a combination of a camera and a map, and the map uh, should have the location of these variable speed lines, uh, speed limit uh, signs. So then it can uh, tell the camera uh, where those are um, and help with the detection. The camera would then read the speed limit, and if the vehicle is actually a connected one that shares that information back uh, to the cloud, then that information can be shared back uh, via NDS Live with a real live layer uh, along the path of other vehicles that are able to consume this. And they can then get uh, that speed limit information before uh, their cameras can actually see that. That's technically possible, but again, it depends on uh, connectivity, it depends on how much money you will spend. Uh, on that feature, how premium that uh, vehicle feature is in the car. Um, so yeah, you're free to um, do it in multiple ways. And you of course can also get uh, this information not just by the camera, but also accessing online services directly from the um, road authorities and so on, who are sharing these. Not all of them do, but this is rolling all this one, right? Yeah, exactly. Good, then I'll uh, wrap it up. Um, if you're interested in learning more about uh, NDS Live, um, then I want to encourage you to request an evaluation license for NDS Live by contacting Markus Juncker. Uh, he's our NDS Association Administrator. His contact details are currently displayed on screen. Uh, you can always go to our website at nds-association.org as well, uh, where you find a contact form to get in touch. Um, hope you enjoyed our webinar today about the advantages of uh, using NDS Live, um, and I hope you found this all useful and informative. As I said at the beginning, the uh, webinar was recorded. We'll share the video and the slides uh, on our website and YouTube channel. Once available, we'll make a post on LinkedIn. And if you've missed uh, the live sessions of the previous webinars, uh, then you can view those slides and the full recordings already. Simply go to the news section on the NDS Association website. And then I hope we'll see you again on March 25th, when it's all about layering map data by freshness and use cases and delivering them the smart way to cloud systems and vehicles with NDS Live. And with that, um, thank you very much. Have a great day and hope to see you again uh, in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Visit our website for news on NDS at nds-association.org.